Global Church family, welcome to the ongoing conversation about international missions here at Fellowship Bible Church, where you get a front row seat to hear what God is continually doing to establish His church around the world. My name is Emma Kate, and I am your host for today, and we are joined by one of our missions pastors, Jim Poole, to discuss his recent trip to visit Ghana and Togo. So welcome back. Yeah, thank you. So thanks so much for being here in your very short window, because you're about to head out again, aren't you? Yeah, home for nine days. Wow. Came back uh, Saturday. Day wow. and heading out on Monday, so just gotcha. back for nine days. Wow, so exciting! Very short, very short, but back to the warmth of Africa, right? That's where you're going next. Yes, it won't be as war- as warm as it was uh, where we were in Togo okay. and Ghana. It was super hot. Really? Uh, yeah, it was um, like 103. Oh my gosh! In the day. Wow. And where we were meeting in uh, Togo. And then in Ghana, both of them, we were meeting in churches. Okay. And there's no air conditioning. Gotcha. Fans. Okay. And sometimes the power would be on. Sometimes the power would not be on. Okay. And so just hot. You yeah. Know? So circumstantially, it was a difficult trip. Okay. Moving forward, I'm going to go to Rwanda and Zambia, much you know farther to the east mm-hmm. in Africa. It'll be a lot cooler. Oh, so okay. So instead of being like highs in the... You know, over a hundred, it would mm-hmm. be high at like eighty. Oh, so wow! So that'll much, be much, much better. better. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to. It. So, is it like jungle rainforest in um, these countries, or is it just like more in deserty Togo dry? In, in Ghana, it was deserty dry. Okay, it was dry season. Oh, and gotcha. Just dusty, just dusty, dusty, dusty. Now they had one random rainstorm in Togo, uh, real unusual, but it was so dry that okay. the ground just immediately absorbed you know wow. the moisture and it, you wouldn't have thought it had it rained at all wow so yeah, it wasn't it was just just dry and hot gotcha, yeah, it, was, gotcha. it was a hot season so we're like why yeah. did joshua play in these conferences yeah <laughs> during these times so yeah. yeah yeah so you mentioned joshua um yukuba he planned mm-hmm. these conferences can you talk a little bit about that and expound on why um scott just got back from a trip as well all part of the same plan um, but can you talk about this overall plan of doing these conferences in multiple nations in africa yeah so joshua yakubu He's been here uh, many times, uh, as well as Simon Yako uh, oh, okay. and Ruth, and mm-hmm. Joshua's wife is Melissa. So um, Joshua is the um, the EMS. And what does EMS stand for again? Um, Sorry. Evangelical Missionary Society. Okay. <clears throat> he is the coordinator for their uh, their missionaries mm-hmm. outside of Nigeria. Oh, okay. So EMS has missionaries that are inside Nigeria doing missions work inside in Nigeria. Joshua coordinates all those that are missionaries outside of Nigeria. Gotcha. So last April, we did a conference in Jos, which is in Nigeria. And um, <clears throat> we helped to bring all of the EMS missionaries to Josh for this conference. And uh, we we gave an overview of the meta narrative okay. and of the Knowing God lessons over a three day conference. Oh, okay. So there were all these Nigerian missionaries to mm-hmm. Kenya, to Uganda, to Togo, to Ghana, to Rwanda, to Zambia, mm-hmm. to Burkina Faso, to Cameroon. All these places where we are now going. Okay. Their missionaries from Nigeria were at this conference last April. Okay. Hopefully that connection is there. Mm -hmm. So we shared the overview of the Knowing God lessons there in the meta narrative, and people really appreciated it. And so they said, hey, we, like, when can you come bring these lessons and this uh, perspective of studying God's word Mm -hmm. to our countries? Like they wanted us to come to their country. Mm -hmm. And so we said, hey, that's up to Joshua and Simon, you Mm -hmm. know, so go talk to them. And um, so uh, that's how it originated. Okay. And then in October of last year, when um, Simon and Joshua were here mm-hmm. for the conference, for our Global Missions Conference, uh, we, t- we talked and we met and we laid out a plan for how we could visit in all these uh, different uh, 13 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. countries. Okay. So that's how it originated. Gotcha. And there's so many for us to go to that lots of times, most of the time, Scott and I would travel together. Right. But there's just too many to go to. Mm-hmm. And so his first trip out was to um, was 
to go with Joshua. My first trip out was with Simon, and now we're going to cross. I'm going to go with Joshua, and he's going to okay. go with Simon. And then the next one's going to be I'm going to go with Simon, he's going to go with Joshua. Gotcha. So there's just too many mm-hmm. countries to cover for yeah. him and I to go together. We, yeah. we couldn't get to them all in a year right? if we tried to do it together. Right. But that's how we're ending up in all these different countries. Is okay. It was a result of last year's conference mm-hmm. when we brought all these people together in, in Nigeria. Okay, gotcha. Well, that's so very exciting. <laughs> um, and you mentioned that the what you guys taught at these conferences was the meta narrative mm-hmm. and the overview of knowing God. And again, that will be future podcast episodes. We'll dive into those things. Um, but for now, those are very um, foundational um, truths that mm-hmm. are shared the, in those two teaching times. And so what were some big takeaways? Like what were some things that the participants of the conference came away with feeling like they had a better grasp of or a better understanding of before the, than before the conference. Right, yeah. So I don't want to speak too much to the Togo because also uh, Michael and Christiana Newland mm-hmm. went with uh, us to Togo. Yes. And they're going to also share on, uh, on this podcast as well about mm-hmm. the Togo part. And so they went with us to Togo. There were some people there that had already had exposure to the Knowing God lessons. Okay. Uh, they were from Lopa, who okay. actually um, we had been work we've been working with for a while, and so what the meta narrative part or the grand story or the big picture? Mm-hmm. Because I had somebody ask me there, you know, so what does meta narrative actually mean? Which I think is actually a good question. It is a good that question. Probably, we can even talk about here a little bit more as we keep going in further podcasts. But mm-hmm. for now, you know, big picture, a grand story. Um, it, it talks about God's God's grand story or big picture that starts before the foundation of the world. Mm-hmm. And so um, people really, that meant a lot to people because most of our contemplation of God, our view of God, like when we begin to consider God begins in Genesis 1-1. Right, right. And so as we talk about the meta narrative or the, the big picture, we, everybody knows, you know, God is eternal. Mm-hmm. And so what did, what has God revealed about himself before Genesis 1? And, and, and what is, is his mind like? What is his heart like? What is his plan before Genesis uh, 1, 1? And that, that was impactful to people. Okay. People that had heard Knowing God lessons before, some of them in Togo, um, was a new material for them, but the meta narrative was. Oh, okay. So, and them adding the meta narrative onto what they knew mm-hmm. of the Knowing God lessons was impactful for them. And then those that were hearing the um, the Knowing God lessons for the first time, uh, many testimonies about um, just contemplating God mm-hmm. um, before Genesis one. Okay. I think you know people would never given any thought to the fact that, you know, God didn't begin in Genesis 1. Yet it's interesting because as believers, we would say that God is eternal. Right, right. But we don't contemplate God beyond, or we don't contemplate God before Genesis mm-hmm. 1-1, but we say yeah. God is eternal. So that perspective, I'll, right. we'll, say, we'll say more of that, won't get into that too yeah. much. But many testimonies from people in Togo and people in Ghana that um, it was very helpful for them to see um, God's plan began in eternity past. Okay. That um, it, it really opened their view of God, kind of so enlarged their view of God, uh, kind of, you know, want to just blow up people's view of God. Mm-hmm. And, right. And that type of thing. Yeah. And our minds blown by yeah. how God is revealing himself. And yeah. I think seeing the meta narrative and Mm -hmm. God, his plan began in eternity past. And what does that look like? What does that mean? Right. What's significant from God's perspective towards man? What is it significant towards man's perspective of God? Right. That was very impactful. Yeah. Yeah. People. And and, um, I recorded some testimonies on my phone Mm -hmm. and um, just tried to capture. None of them are long. Mm hmm. 
but just try to capture people's thoughts. You know, yeah, what yeah. do you think of the conference or what do you think of the lessons and, you know, yeah. four or five minutes and maybe you guys can give links to. Yeah, yeah. We'll put um, <clears throat> some links in the comments uh, or in the description of the yeah. podcast. That way people can go and click and actually hear what um, they had to say because, man, teaching the meta narrative is just so important. I remember the first time I heard you guys teach it and I was like, I knew God was eternal, but it just, it radically transforms how you read the Bible, how you even relate to God, knowing that this was his plan before time began. And as you study it and know it, there is such freedom that comes from that. And so that's why it's so exciting to hear you guys go and teach this, because this is allowing all these people to experience freedom in a way that they Mm -hmm. might have not experienced had they not had that perspective of reading the Bible. So that's so exciting. Um, Are there any other um, ideas or things that came out? I know, I think you mentioned previously in our conversation that like the, their view of Satan is interesting and that might've come up during the conference. It always does in any uh, African countries, not only African countries, but you know, lots of places around the world, people have a really elevated view of Satan Mm, and of the spirit world. And so as we walk through the lessons, lesson number three talks about God's creation of the spirit world. Okay. That God created uh, the spirits. And then lesson number eight talks about the fall of Lucifer, Mm. who then, you know, his name is changed from Lucifer, his name is changed to Satan. And so for people to just have a biblical, a correct biblical teaching about the angelic realm, Mm They were created, number one. Yep. So therefore, the creator is more powerful than the creature. So that sets the authority structure. Yeah, So right absolutely. out of the gate, you know, that begins to get, okay, mm-hmm. this elevated view of Satan and the angelic realm, that begins to change their perspective. Okay, yeah, you know what? God did create them. So mm-hmm. therefore, God's more powerful than them. So it begins to inform them. And then, like, why did God, why did God create them? They were created to be his messengers and his servants. And you just look at like a biblical, you know, a small biblical um, theology of the angelic realm. Okay. Why did God create them? Mm-hmm. And then you really see the heart of God by God creating the the, the angelic realm before Genesis 1-1, mm-hmm. before he created anything else. And that right. communicates the heart of God mm-hmm. because he is revealing himself to the angelic realm mm-hmm. by having them watch his creation yeah. in Genesis 1. Again, that communicates mm-hmm. the heart of God. And then we see, um, you know, in Isaiah, we see that, you know, Lucifer's desire to be God. Mm-hmm. And then that there's no way that Lucifer could be God right. because God is eternal. And for Lucifer to be God, God would have to make him God, which therefore mm-hmm. makes him not God because God is eternal. Right. So, right. So for people to see that, and then we, we unpack that a little bit more <clears throat> in the fact that um, Satan can only do what, in the, in, the, in the demons, can only do what God allows him to do. Right. And, and as you lay all that out, that's very helpful for them mm-hmm. because they have this uh, real in, inflated view of, the, of demons and Satan. Gotcha. And they give them a lot of, too much credit. Okay. And then, and then we see that, God is actually using um, Satan and the demons at times to carry out God's plan. Mm-hmm. And, we're, right. and they're like, wow. Like, mm-hmm. So in, in the garden, who did God use to deceive and tempt Adam and Eve? Yeah. He used a serpent. Right. Who did God use to, um, to uh, deceive uh, Judas? Mm-hmm. It was so we, you know, I mean, two major points. Right. God was using, you know, Satan mm-hmm. to carry out his plan, the fall, yeah, and then yeah. the and then the crucifixion of Christ. So mm-hmm. when you see it in that perspective, uh, so many testimonies to your specific question, mm-hmm. many testimonies of people saying, "Oh, it was very helpful to see um, the right perspective of uh, Satan and demons, mm-hmm. and that they're not equally powerful right. as God." Right. They're not like equally fighting and who's going to win that I don't need to be fearful of, yeah. you know, of being controlled by Satan or the demons because 
you know, I'm a believer, I'm a child of God. Right, yeah. They are created beings and therefore under the authority mm-hmm. of God. And right. they can only do what God allows them to do. Mm-hmm. And if God allows them to do something, God's allowed it for a purpose. So, yeah, their perspective of the angelic realm and okay. of the demonic realm of, of Satan is, is, is there's always a lot of discussion. It's always lively because they come in with the mindset <clears throat> right. of, of, you know, of an elevated view of Satan and demons. Mm-hmm. So it's always lots of questions and it's always exciting and kind of interesting. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, for, yeah. I bet. And then, so they're coming in with their like mindset and you guys are coming in saying, here is grace and freedom. And then it's that, I bet that's so fun to get to watch them wrestle through what they thought to be true with actual truth and then arrive at the conclusion of, okay, as I'm studying the scriptures, I'm seeing, yes, this is true. And so then there's, again, we were talking about that freedom that comes from that. And so watching these people come to these conferences and wrestle, is there any legalism that you see kind of in how they live their lives that might then fall away because of wrestling with this these truths yeah yeah very much so <clears throat> and um yeah if, if listeners please listen to uh, some of the testimonies that i captured mm-hmm. because uh, people really speak to that uh, one gentleman pastor he said that he was you know killing himself trying oh to serve gosh. god and uh, trying to do his best to do what you know god wanted him to do and just getting nowhere and um just laboring and laboring and laboring you know to no avail Mm -hmm. and just and so yeah so there's lots of lots of legalism and when you start before the foundations of the world with god's plan that is based on grace Mm -hmm. and the finished work of christ that lays the eternal Mm -hmm. plan god's eternal foundation is laid Mm -hmm. there and and that's carried all the way through the old testament then we get into the new testament and so people see it and you watch and wrestle with it through the couple of days okay. that we're together mm-hmm. because they're coming in legalistic. They're coming in okay. dependent upon their own strength, their own abilities, their own efforts, their own talents, their own wisdom. They're, it's based, it's all depend, dependent upon themselves. Okay. And so right out of the gate, we're seeing that it's God's eternal plan, that it's all based upon you know God's grace and the finished work of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so... In fact, one lady said to me, <clears throat> this was Wednesday, and she was the wife of the pastor who was hosting the conference. We went out to dinner with them the third evening. She said, you know, the first day, she said, I was really mad with you guys. I was really upset with what you guys were saying. Wow. And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't sitting easy with me. I was upset. And, um, but by the middle of the Middle of the second day into the third day, I began to see what you guys were saying. And I, I, not, not what we were saying, but I began to see it from the Word of God. Mm-hmm. I began to see what God's Word was saying as we started before the foundations of the earth, looked at God's interaction with Adam and Eve. We moved on into Cain. We moved on into um, Abraham and just God's interaction with people. She, she said, now I'm... I'm, I'm seeing it according to God's plan. But initially it was tough. Yeah. So to your question of do we see legalism? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And um, because people are dependent upon themselves. And um, there's many testimonies of, of people seeing that they don't have to you know, try to work for God mm-hmm. anymore yeah. in and of themselves. They don't have to try to you know, do ministry for God in and of themselves anymore because they're seeing from God's word what his eternal plan is and now how he wants to carry out his plan okay which is still based on grace and the finished work of Christ which is yeah. now the source mm-hmm. for you know what they're able to what they're able to do which change you know which changes oh my changes gosh everything yes and so, absolutely and so yeah so we, we stories and testimonies like that and uh, watching people think it through in yeah. their minds throughout four days mm-hmm. yeah that's awesome yeah. 
That's so great. Well, I have one more question <laughs> for you before we turn it over to mm-hmm. um, Michael and Christiana. Um, is there any moment that you can think from the trip, if somebody says, just give me one moment of where you saw God really move or work, do you have something in your mind or is it just overall watching the people wrestle um, with the truths as they process through that? Yeah, I think I think like the story I told of that pastor's wife okay. um, was a moment because she gave testimony okay. of, of, of God through his Holy Spirit. Just working in her heart. That to her over yeah. a span of three days. Mm-hmm. And then the last day, we had people, we gave people the opportunity to share stories. And um, many people, uh, got up and they shared short testimonies, you know, like under five mm-hmm. minutes mm-hmm. of what the teaching had meant to them. Okay. And so then when you have the chance and the opportunity because of God and his plan and his grace to just, you know, be used by him to unfold his word. Mm-hmm. And then you can hear people's testimonies of what it's meant to them mm-hmm. after three and a half, four days. Uh, that's really, it's, it's very, um, it, it's, it's, it's rewarding because you're seeing God work. Mm-hmm. It's it makes you very thankful, it makes you very humble, and yeah. it's just great moments because you know you're hearing that they're getting it. Mm-hmm. You know you're you're hearing that they're understanding it a little bit. And yeah, um, yeah we broke up into small groups because it was so hot. Okay. That uh, we taught in the morning, and then we did like we broke up into groups in the afternoon. We gave them questions to answer, and so. You know, I would be in a group and watching them wrestle with the questions. And then if needed, if I needed to kind of give some direction to lead them to where, you know, to where the answer was Mm -hmm. and see them thinking it through and then God leading them to the right answer. And then on the last day, you know, them giving testimony of of what they were understanding. Um, Yeah, those are those are that's that's a great time. Yeah. when When you hear hear them saying and, and articulating what right. God's done in four days. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I know I will be praying as well as the rest of FBC for you guys as you head off to your next countries. Um, and now we're going to transition to hear from Michael and Christiana about their time. Thanks. So thank you, Michael and Christiana, for coming up and joining us here at the podcast today. So welcome back from Togo. Super exciting that you guys got to go. Um, But I'll just jump right in. Michael, will you kind of give just a really brief uh, description of how you and Christiana have been involved with Global Missions here at FBC? Yeah, um, it's like uh, all things FBC missions. There's a a long version and a short version. Mm -hmm. Uh, Short version would be um, that uh, I had an interest in missions uh, from my teenage years and um, went to FBC actually as a, a teenager. Um, we knew Tim McManigal was in a Bible study with him back, uh, yeah, as a 18, 19 year old, 20 year old perhaps too. Um, and uh, let's see, we lived in, in Germany together for eight years. Um, when we returned, oh, uh, I got an opportunity to um, go on a trip with, where did we go? To India, I believe, um, with uh, with Tim. And um, pretty much after that, they asked me to maybe not join, but participate in the, uh, the missions committee, uh, which I did. And so I've actually been a part of that group now for, uh, this will make the 20th year. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So, uh, so as a result, uh, been involved in the sort of the monthly meetings and been able to go on actually a lot of trips. Um, so uh, I feel very privileged to kind of be an insider yeah. uh, for for FPC yeah. missions. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Twenty years. That's so yeah, cool. Yeah, I kind of forgot. Yeah, I'm it still. Was that long. <laughs> I'm still up until just a few years ago. I was still the junior member. Okay. <laughs> we added a few people, uh, gotcha. but it's still compared to the others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I feel like the junior member sometimes. Mm-hmm. So we've been. I mean, Michael has gone on more trips, but you know, mm-hmm. I've been involved. We've been able to like um, help with the marriage conference in okay. Kenya. We've uh, taken youth. To India, mm-hmm. and Michael helped with the Zambia, Zambia. trip. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so we've just had you know a few opportunities to go mm-hmm. and to help and yeah so yeah, so you guys have a good understanding of what Jim and Scott do when they travel. So I don't know, Christiana, if you kind of want to speak to what like an average day at these conferences that they're doing in Africa, like what did it look like in Togo? Okay, so it was very interesting. Uh, you know, it's a conference that in this format, I don't think would ever be done in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the background is that at least in Togo, and I think for most of those conferences, it's they are you know it's mostly pastors Mm -hmm. or pastors in training or um people that are doing church planting uh so you know they they come there because they literally want this as a training you know it's Mm -hmm. not just church members it's actually church leaders or church planters but the way it was set up was it was almost like a a school day taken to the extreme Mm -hmm. i mean it's like it required a lot of concentrating Mm -hmm. sitting but like six lessons within one morning wow five minute breaks you know and Mm -hmm. i was trying to say to simon from nigeria who is who organized the whole conference in togo i was like don't they need a break like Mm -hmm. 45 minutes and then we give them a break and Mm -hmm. simon was you know pretty adamant that it's too hot and Mm -hmm. you know we needed to get all this done in the morning i just don't see um anybody here being willing to sit that much but people stayed concentrated and Mm -hmm. like uh, they didn't look like they were overwhelmed by all Mm -hmm. the sitting and they were interested Mm -hmm. and it was a pretty long day so with six lessons normally in the morning and then in the afternoon there were breakout sessions okay um that I could also help with because Mm -hmm. there were pastor's wives there Mm -hmm. Um, so it was really sitting and discussing and studying from eight o'clock in the morning through we were done at 530. Officially done, but we never got away from there until 730. Okay. Eight. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. was yeah. including dinner, but it was a lot of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So just really long days. But I think then that speaks to the hunger that I know that Jim and Scott have both referenced going to these conferences, Mm -hmm. like these pastors and their wives and these church leaders, they're just hungry for this. And so I think that's awesome that, yeah, they didn't mind. They wanted to be there that long. They wanted to wrestle with the scriptures. So they clearly did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could, you know, you could read them and people were, I mean, their faces were, it was clear they were engaged and Mm -hmm. they would ask questions and they would ask so many questions indeed that you know, during the question sessions, I mean, I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, if they finally wanted to disperse and have some free time, they had questions. And Mm -hmm. so even those sessions took quite a while. Um, So, yeah. yeah. So then, um, obviously, Jim talked about just a couple minutes ago about you guys taught through um, the meta narrative and then an intro kind of to the knowing God lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what were some of those questions? What were some things that people were wrestling with in Togo in regards to the teaching that was presented to them? Yeah, um, certainly with the, the meta narrative, which I hope the, the folks who aren't familiar with that phrase will will look into that. Um, trying to understand that um, how everything was a part of God's grand plan for the mm-hmm. ages, that, um, you know, this wasn't God created Adam and Eve in the garden and everything was perfect, and then sin came in, and then we go to plan B. You mm-hmm. know, God's contingency plan was to send a deliverer. You know, that um, this actually um, was agreed upon with the, amongst the Trinity uh, mm-hmm. before the, the world was ever created. Right. Um, uh, I really uh, tried to emphasize how significant that is in the fact that um, with the Trinity being there before creation, before time and space, that how that really points to the fact that God is a relational God. Mm-hmm. Like he was in relationship before there was anything. He didn't need to make Adam and Eve to have a, a being to be in relationship with. He he already was right. and that is his nature that's who he is and he wants us to be to, to be involved in that and it's that relationship with god that is is sort of the, the crux of the entire the bible uh, what god is trying to accomplish and to to kind of bring us back to that um and so i wouldn't say that they struggled with that as much as it was just a new concept Mm -hmm. and they were trying to synthesize this into what they already know Mm. um you know there were some concepts that seemed new and they wrestled with it on kind of 
just on face value, but this was more like, that sounds right, and yet I had never thought of that. And so, mm-hmm. you know, they were they were kind of trying to, to fit that into their grid of like, well, what do these other Bible right. stories seem to indicate? And, um, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what were some maybe of the new concepts that they were um, wrestling with during this time? Christiana, did you notice? Yeah, so one one concept, and you know, I couldn't say it was all of them, but there was definitely conversations we had. Mm-hmm. The concept, um, you're saved by grace. Mm-hmm. We think for the most part that was understood. Um, we're not 100% sure, um, but for the most part, we think that was understood. But then it was clearly there were quite a few pastors really struggling with the idea that when you come to faith, that afterwards even to be sanctified it's a walk of faith and Mm. by faith Mm -hmm. so that it's not you you're saved by grace and then you will yourself into being sanctified you Mm -hmm. so even um one one conversation i had or like we continue to have through the Mm -hmm. week there was one pastor that was invited that was not really connected with the missionaries that we work with with Mm -hmm. the equa church uh, he was invited by them, and uh, they were missionaries from Nigeria. Okay. And so they, like, especially the husband, really struggled with this concept that it's not his obedience that is going to ma- sanctify him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, were, and, you know, he was interested enough. He came over and over. He asked a ton of questions. I mean, he would track us down afterwards. And, um, but you could tell the wife really got it. I mean, you could mm. tell by, I mean, she was sitting there. She was like focused on this. And in the beginning, like we had, you know, one of our breakout sessions, the question was, what does God expect of us? And she immediately said obedience. Mm. Wow. I mean, that was her answer. Yeah. And so, you know, then we were trying to look at the mm-hmm. scriptures of how you know the scripture teaches you know we have Mm -hmm. like we might want to do this but then our flesh is not going to do this but how god has provided everything and Mm -hmm. and she was just taking this in like she was really um and i don't know that she was even wrestling with it she was taking it in and at the end Mm -hmm. like you could tell in the breakout sessions she got it Mm -hmm. like she understood this is still a walk by Mm -hmm. faith like i'm not saved by faith and then i will myself into being Mm -hmm. a good believer so I don't know that the husband got it mm-hmm. as much, uh, no. but I mean he was interested enough, you know. So to he come was there, and, ask. and he he felt like he needed to set us straight, but he was respectful enough that okay. he didn't let that uh, it did it didn't interfere with the teaching at all. Um, but yeah, clearly we've been praying for him mm-hmm. <laughs> quite yeah. a bit. But but the wife, you could tell, I, I liked. To think of it as like God had already prepared her heart mm. in the circumstances, mm-hmm. so it just like she heard it and she knew it was right. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Is is I mean I, that's the way I I can recall kind of coming to understanding these mm-hmm. things. It was you know somebody explained it, but it, God had already done the work to to make me ready to to just mm-hmm. know it, to it, know that it's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and and generally the people. That were there, the uh, the church planners and the pastors uh, in Togo. I would say, mm, certainly not universally, but there were a lot that seemed to get it. Um, they still had some some questions, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, that was that was also really one of the the main focuses. And that was, you know, the the knowing God lessons are designed to to bring that out, mm-hmm. um, and that is pretty much universal across the church wherever we go whether it's africa or asia or anywhere for that matter and um you know i have no doubt that um churches here at home Mm -hmm. uh, wrestle with that too you know even if they even know enough to wrestle with it Mm -hmm. you know um so yeah Yeah. i mean i think one awesome thing that i felt kind of came across was that just the greatness of our God. Like if you think God is big enough to save you, but then you you sanctify yourself, you will yourself into sanctification. And then really looking, you know, as they were doing the lessons, looking into Abraham, how great of a guy was he really? He, like we remember him, you know, for this guy that had faith. And that's, you know, the New mm-hmm. Testament talks about this. But to look at him, how did he get there? Did mm-hmm. God choose him because he was such a great guy? No, he chose right. him before he, there was anything great about mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. And I think that was, uh, that I felt like that was a concept, you know, to see 
God is not choosing mm-hmm. me because I'm so awesome. He yeah. can turn me into something awesome, but it's mm-hmm. completely his work. Right. And and so that throughout the week was definitely like God is not limited by our inability, like or our lack of faith or you know that and to really look at those examples in the lessons like be it Moses, be it David, mm-hmm. you know, it, I mean if you look at it it all comes out that it was God's work and God chose them mm-hmm. and that's what made them awesome not yeah. the other way around right right yeah 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 um jim taught a lesson on christ's discipling of peter mm-hmm. and that seemed to really resonate with them um almost well more than abraham at least that's the sense that i got just because it was a little closer to contemporary times it was um new testament it was christ working with him and you know it's just sort of like you see peter and his impulsiveness and Mm -hmm. just getting it wrong time after time after time and 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 just like i find peter is the easiest to identify with uh Mm -hmm. and and i think they must have too because that really was impactful for them Mm -hmm. uh and really really worth the time to look at um and to just step back and actually most of us would need the discipline to intentionally look for seeing how how did peter fail Mm -hmm. you know and then how did how did that not um be a hindrance to what God was doing, how Christ ultimately would use him. Um, so that that was a that was a really good part too. That uh, we heard feedback that that was that was impactful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, on a practical note, you know, it was a little hard in Ghana. I know we were in Togo. In Togo, uh, you know, that uh, like I think a lot of the countries that Jim and Scott go to, they are English speaking countries. And so Togo and some of those in West Africa, they are French uh, okay. speaking. So there was always the translation piece, mm-hmm. which made it a little harder for all of us to interact directly. We always needed a translator. Um, mm-hmm. So I think with all the travels we've done before, that had not been an issue. It oh, was in countries, okay. you know, Kenya, they speak English. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, yeah, I'd say pretty universally there's translation going on, but it's often English to... Um, you know, whatever the local language is, this was interesting because it was French and it was so kind of broadly recognized. Um, but yeah, fortunately, it was only uh, from English to French, and okay. we weren't, weren't doing yeah. additional <laughs> no tribal languages. You know, there right. were plenty of people; they all had their own tribal languages, but French was uh, okay. was universally mm-hmm. uh, sort of the lingua franca, so to speak. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. So, um, yeah. That was good. It it does uh, add to the time. Yes. Um, yeah. Right. But um, doubles the time. It doubles. pretty much doubles the time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that's so awesome. And I think you know it's it's cool to see like you guys get to go and watch God um, work and like reveal His truth and reveal Himself uh, to these people and then just. I don't know, whenever I travel in these contexts, it just, again, like you were speaking to the greatness of God, like that was a theme that really came out of this. And then like, man, God works all over the world, revealing himself to all these people. Mm -hmm. And I think we can get so focused of, he's just working in my church, in my heart right now, Mm -hmm. but no, he's got it everywhere. And that's so exciting. So is there other stories or interactions that were just really encouraging that you just got to watch God move in the hearts of the people that were at this conference? Uh, yeah, the stories are many. A um, so, uh, highlight would be uh, the the young pastor, church planner, who was translating for me most of the time. Um, to hear him, kind of after the fact, I was asking him what you know what were the most impactful parts, um, and and to hear him reflect just practically, he said, "Well, just last week I was talking to my mother, and I was like." He, he said, you know, Mom, how can you call yourself a, a, a real Christian when you don't fast at least once a week? Mm. I mean, and, and it was just, it's it was that prevalent and mm-hmm. that common and that sort of universally accepted that, that, that you've got to work for your sanctification mm-hmm. and you got to, you, you know, you got to be obedient to please mm-hmm. God, like like Christiana was, was suggesting from the, the other couple. Um, and uh, yeah, just sort of like the, the the opening of their eyes and the sort of the relief, like mm-hmm. it takes such a burden oh, absolutely. away um, 
that was really, mm-hmm. really... Yeah, to watch that legalism that they've been mm-hmm. putting on themselves oh, just yeah. fall away. And I mean, that's something I think that we also have to remember. It's universal. That happens here in yeah. the state. Like, oh, it sure does. Everywhere, legalism creeps in. We put yeah. it on ourselves. Mm-hmm. And it just comes from a wrong understanding most of the time of the scriptures. And so it's so awesome when the Lord just reveals himself and takes that away. Mm-hmm. And how exciting that you guys got to be there and mm. to witness that. What about you, Christiana? What was it like... Um, um, interacting with the pastor's wives because you said that there mm-hmm. were some there um, and you mentioned that one story but what was it like interacting with them um, again I I did think with the translate uh, translation always going on that made it harder mm-hmm. um, because they would really tend to want to speak to people that could speak French gotcha. um, but you know I was excited they came along uh, you know, because I think even traditionally the teaching has been mainly kind of geared towards the pastors, but really those church planters and pastors, they're standing in ministry together. Mm-hmm. And if the wife don't, if the wives don't understand the grace message or that, you know, that God is, can do this in them and that they just need to turn to the Lord mm-hmm. and he will do the work, um, like they need to be, they need to come along. And so I don't know how many were there. I was maybe, maybe a third of them brought their wives what would you say but you know that in itself was so encouraging because yeah. they are gonna they are i mean the church planters you know they go off mm-hmm. and and they start with nothing and they it's just the two of them and um for them to be there together and learn together and wrestle with those questions mm-hmm. i don't think the the wives ever even spoke up and had questions in the in the in the bigger group when we had questions asked that was mainly the pastors but within the breakout sessions they did okay so that was, it was just a blessing to have them there mm-hmm. uh, and to feel like we're not just equipping the husbands and then the wives, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. they were teaching legalism in right. their Sunday school or to their kids right. or, you know, so it was just, that was really mm-hmm. awesome to have yeah. them um, yeah. at the conference. That's great. And then these, um, the people at the conferences, they are part of EMS. So they are missionaries, right? So they are um, from all over Togo that these churches that they represented were from. It wasn't just Lome where you guys were. Yeah, it was throughout Togo. Okay. Um, uh, p- pastors and church planters. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then some people that had been invited uh, from the Lome area. Um, actually, uh, we're going to upload uh, an interview that uh, that I did with Simon Yako, who many uh, mm-hmm. of you will will know, and uh, you know you would recognize him, uh, where he explained sort of the different folks that were coming. Um, and, and indeed there were some, some pastors from the local area who, um, you know, I found almost surprising that, uh, that they were able to invite some and that they would come because it's, um, it's almost an, an admission of the fact that another church might have something to offer. Mm. Um, but yeah, they, they did come. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I know there was, uh, one, pastor from the the Kotakoli tribe which is a predominantly Muslim tribe okay and um, he specifically brought others from from his area that weren't directly related with EMS or equa okay by the way these uh, acronyms I think we're gonna have an interview with Pete Bittner mm-hmm. that people could listen to okay. where these are explained um, worthy of listening to because mm-hmm. it's um, it's a fascinating story how you know this is uh, missions organization that spans over a hundred years and just sort of the, the the unlikely way that God has brought FBC into this right. this mix of uh, you know why were we in Togo in the first place right, right. Uh, really fascinating story so definitely worth listening mm-hmm. to um, but yeah so he just brought other pastors from his community and um, we've actually got an interview with him because he um, he was actually um, uh, went to a, a Quranic school oh, okay. and uh, had spent years studying the Quran. Mm-hmm. Um, I found it really interesting to talk to him because such an important part of the lessons was, you know, highlighting how it is the relationship ultimately comes back to this relationship that God wants with us. Right. I mean, that's why he's doing things the way the way he does. That's mm-hmm. why that's why our sanctification happens by grace. We don't we don't earn it because. Right. We have to be dependent upon God in order for for this relationship mm-hmm. to 
to work. It's the dependence right. that makes the relationship. Right. And so, um, you know, to, from someone who comes from a background where uh, the Quran says, um, God is not a father and he has no son. Mm. And in to, to come to this teaching where, like, that's what it's all about. And just to kind of appreciate the fact that he could appreciate mm -hmm. it more than most mm. was really kind of interesting. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so very cool. Um, so you mentioned he's from a Muslim background. So just really briefly, what is the overall culture like of Togo? Do they experience persecution for being believers? Um, what's their experience? Just so that we know how best to pray for our brothers and sisters in Togo. Do mm -hmm. you want to start? Well, there's definitely a bigger uh, Muslim uh, part. The, the population that is mm -hmm. Muslim is is fairly big. And from the countries that I've been to, really, the Christian faith is not anywhere close to as dominant as in some other um, countries. I mean, I think, you know, I'm trying to remember, the Protestant church makes up 6% or 9% of the population. It was fairly small, mm. and it's growing, but it's, it's definitely... You know, we didn't hear of persecution, but it's mm -hmm. certainly not any majority opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's definitely a, a big area. Yeah, there's a there's a secular French culture, I'd okay. say, is sort of predominant with the with the sort of the indigenous animism That's kind true. of mixed mm -hmm. in. Uh, there's not there weren't a whole lot of Muslims like th that we could recognize in their dress or whatever. Okay. Uh, I never heard uh, uh, a call to prayer once oh, okay. while we were there, which okay. um, the further north you go, mm -hmm. the more inland is mm -hmm. where the, the Muslims uh, have a, a much bigger influence. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the, the Kotakoli is a, is a big tribe and they're kind of in the central part. Okay. Uh, all the way to the north, there are, um, there's a group called the Fulani. They're like herdsmen and they are, they're pretty radical. Um, they conduct... Uh, Know, raids and murder mm. Christians and so um, there, there seems to be kind of universally in this sub-Saharan Africa this gradient okay. Christ, Christian yeah. influence uh, in the south along the coast um, and the further the further inland you go the less penetration the Western missionaries had um, I, I've even heard stories that um, that there was a very intentional uh, effort on the part of of Western missionaries to go into the sub-Saharan Africa to stop the spread of Islam that was coming south. Mm. Um, I don't have a good reference. Yeah. To, to and point I mean, to, and but... Simon definitely explained to us that in the north, you know, in the north of Nigeria is where a lot of the right. kidnapping is happening. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Nigeria, uh, you know, and Togo is two countries further to, to the, the west. west. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty much it's in the north that they are having the issues so it's like those groups you know they don't look at the right. borders you right. know they're active there in the north another thing that simon mentioned to us and he kind of pointed things out is a lot of the churches really struggle with indigenous beliefs animism to mm. be taken into the church okay. and kind of mixing things and and also you know when they're talking about um, the power of the enemy to to mix things from their traditional beliefs mm -hmm. with what the Bible is actually teaching. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing he kind of pointed out um, to us. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's um, super uh, important to know and important to pray for um, our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. there. But I want to thank you guys so sure. much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate uh, having you guys here. And then for all of our listeners and viewers, remember that we always love to hear from you. So send us your thoughts, questions, requests, um, and you can do that at fbcva.org slash podcast and write us. Um, and if you know of anyone who hasn't checked out this podcast, remind them that they can follow us on YouTube or wherever they get their podcasts. Um, and so as we close out, let us remember that it is Christ who is continually building his church until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Have a great day.